Good afternoon. This is the exploit track, and this is our final talk from Tim Shelton. Without any further ado, I present you. All right. Great. So for you, those of you that uh, are not uh, here live, um, we've actually got more people. I was just informed we've got more people on the internet watching me than we do uh, here in the room. So uh, we can pretty much hear a penny drop. Um, so my name's Tim Shelton. Um, if you can't tell, I'm from Texas, and uh, I am not a steer. So you can figure all that out. Just kidding. Uh, I'm with a company called Hawk Network Defense. Uh, they're a security information and event manager. Uh, basically, we created a product in 2006. I helped create algorithms and all that jazz, and so we're competing in that market. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, one of the uh, key things we do have is we have a real-time iSeries agent. Anybody run the iSeries AS400 out there? Yeah, I got four hands. That's awesome. All right. So I know the rest of you are lying because I know everybody has an iSeries. Um, <laughs> so a little bit about me. Um, back in 2005, I was the, so let me back up. I'm pretty sure you never heard of me, so that's why I put the slide in there. Uh, back in 2005, I was the, one of the first people to break out of virtualization. Um, I broke out of uh, VMware, uh, compromised the VMNAT daemon through a funny FTP request that ended up being heap corruption, and so ironically, heap corruption, um, and uh, ended up compromising the host operating system. Um, what that did was created a large security market around virtualization. Um, had I known that was going to be so popular, I might not be standing here today talking about this and other things. So I definitely missed that boat, even though I kind of kicked it off. Um, also, um, so I've been involved in countless, I can, can't count, countless Microsoft, Adobe, Apple bugs, um, vulnerabilities, and or exploits. Um, I'm with a, uh, a group called Black Security also. My name is Red Sand. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if you don't know who I am yet, uh, does anybody remember Stroke dying this year? Anyone? I'm the guy that killed Stroke. So that was my blog post at midnight that we thought was a good idea, and it just uh, it got a lot of momentum. And so who knew, right? Who knew? Um, I was also uh, involved with the uh, releasing the first universal exploit for the 2009 Adobe JBIG2 bug uh, with a co-schemer of mine, uh, Russell Sanford, uh, also exhort. He's with Black Security. <coughs> So we're going to talk about the importance of IBM AIX, um, kind of where it came from, uh, how IBM views it, how the rest of the world views it. Um, I'd like to get some feedback on how you guys view it also. Um, I've gotten uh, tons of different feedback when I've been here at this conference, so I'm kind of curious. Uh, and then we're actually going to go into the uh, different types of methodologies. So we're going to cover two methodologies today. Uh, one, and we'll get into that in further detail, but one, does one is required in one situation, and then in another situation, another one's required. So we kind of killed the entire broad spectrum and made sure that we got everything covered. Oh, and we'll have a live demo, which is actually a lie, because I pre-recorded it, um, because I've, I went to a talk yesterday where their demo didn't work until the third run, uh, and nobody ever likes a failed demo, so. All right, so IBM's view of AIX. Um, this is taken from their marketing information, actually on their website, the front page for AIX. Um, I feel like I've highlighted the, the cool part. Uh, the cool part being they feel it's very secure. Um, <laughs> you'll see that uh, part of it is, you know, they feel that uh, IT needs to provide rock solid security and other stuff. And that's why we feel everyone is choosing AIX to run all of their systems on, all of their uh, architecture, I'm sorry, infrastructure on. Um, so we're going to kind of cover that a little more too and show you where AIX is as far as the progression of making sure they're securing their stuff uh, in comparison to other operating systems like Windows or Linux or even Mac. Or even Solaris, actually, now that I think about it. So, why the, so the question is, why do we use AIX? Um, I know personally I use it to hunt for bugs, but the rest of the world uses it for a few reasons. So ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, which that's a fancy term for data management. Um, but so thing, good examples of that, so good example of applications and whatnot that run on AIX would include PeopleSoft, uh, SAP, 
um, Oracle, so DB2, and there's probably a slew of others, especially in the telephone world, the telecom world, um, the medical uh, healthcare world, as well as uh, federal, state and local, and foreign governments. Um, I've also found that uh, most of the companies that I see running AIX tend to have been around before the creation of these things we call computers. Um, and it seems like that IBM sold them on, or, you know, so, so let's back up. IBM obviously, you know, is one of the reasons why we're here because they created x86 and they released it and then they created a market and so on and so forth. And so because they did that, um, a lot of people have a lot of faith and uh, take a lot of guidance from IBM. So with that said, um, ZOS, AIX, and the I-Series, which used to be called AIS 400, now it's actually System I, excuse me for any people out there that are waiting for me to correct myself. Um, those types of systems are really what we see as the predominant systems that run the critical back-end, like mission critical stuff for different companies. Um, it seems like companies, the newer companies today, are all focused on virtualization, and they're all running x86 or x86-64, um, and maybe some, a little bit of Mac thrown in there. Um, but uh, typically, like I said, what I, I end up seeing is uh, in the environments that do have AIX, they've got at most five pieces of hardware, and typically each one of these power machines are probably running between one and five and sometimes more LPARs, which is their fancy term for uh, basically a virtualized, uh, well, near virtualized um, uh, instance of AIX. So when I, typically when I do a pen test uh, and I'm hunting for AIX, um, uh, so it seems like uh, other people, when they do pen tests, they kind of say, oh, AIX, let's go on the other stuff because I've got 20 Windows boxes that I can own right now with Metasploit. Forget that thing because, you know, who uses it anyway? Well, ironically, while there may be a small instance of it, um, the majority of company data, uh, like the critical data, tends to be in that environment. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, so we talked about DB2 and Oracle and PeopleSoft and uh, JD Edwards and all that. Well, uh, companies rely on that pretty heavily to ensure that uh, as they function as a company, as a business, things work as they need. And this is a type of system that they've had together and in place and been supporting since 1990 or you know even sooner. So. <clears throat> so, all right, um, we're actually going to do a little bit of a review. Um, a great man, David Litchfield, if he's here today, I'd certainly like to meet him. Uh, I was told he was here, and I'm sure he's not at my talk, because I think I'm the only one here. But, uh, I think that, oh, sorry, I just derailed myself. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so back in 2005, uh, David Litchfield uh, decided that he would also focus on AIX, and he, what he went and did is he documented a methodology of uh, heap exploitation for a specific type of scenario, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and what, what we're going to reference it is uh, free slash rightmost. Um, so the, the general summary is Lich, Lich, the Litchfield methodology allows you to take co uh, execution of code, uh, control of the execution of code, uh, after, so allocation, and then there's corruption somewhere, and then a buffer is freed. And then that's an instance where the Litchfield methodology would be used to take control of the code execution. Um, it, we're going to, once again, go through that a little bit more. But, uh, and then we're going to go through my method, which is a, or the new method, which happens the other way. So Litchfield's uh, research kind of pioneered um, some of the security focus on AIX. Um, so, I mean, this might be a bad uh, reference, but, you know, back in the day, everyone says, said Linux was so secure because nobody looked at it. Um, and I kind of feel like AIX is in that same kind of realm. They, everybody claims it's super secure because, you know, all these governments are running it and all these huge companies are running it. And, oh, by the way, we never hear anything about it, so it's got to be secure, right? Yeah, the answer is no. So. <laughs> We're going to uh, go across and show you exactly where AIX is as far as the operating system and what it does to protect you from not doing all these cool hacker things, whereas, you know, Windows and Mac and all these other guys are way down the line with d different types of cookies and randomization and things that they're doing. So it still kind of blows my mind sometimes. Um, so Litchfield's uh, research was done on uh, IBM AIX 5.3. 
Um, I have uh, verified that it does, in fact, work on 6.1, in case anybody cares, because um, I guess at that time it didn't exist, so uh, he wasn't able to claim it. But uh, so, David, your stuff still works. Great. Um, what he allowed, what he provided us was a way uh, of uh, achieving a bidirectional double pointer overwrite. Um, and I know that's a fancy fluey term, but what I'm really trying to say is there's eight bytes. So if it's, you know, 32, it's eight bytes and then they're getting swapped out in memory. Um, and so if anybody's familiar with uh, heap exploitation in general, um, the general methodology is a controllable four byte or double four byte overwrite. Um, and that's been around since, you know, who the heck did the first one? Um, so anyway, it escapes my mind. But it's, so it's been around for a while. It's very well documented. I mean, there's only a few ways of really taking control of code execution. You're either going to overrun a buffer and uh, overwrite something on the stack that's uh, going to get returned into PC or EIP. Um, and then the other way is you're going to be able to write something that you control to a function pointer elsewhere that's not actually one of a dumb, uh, a dumb overflow. It's kind of a little bit more sanitized, but not that much, obviously. <clears throat> so, uh, what it takes is about eight bytes. Um, if I can corrupt eight bytes on the heap, then we are good. Like, we are golden good. Um, what this allows me to do is, with these eight bytes, I can point it to other things that I control differently, and we can make all sorts of happy, great things happen. Um, so, the first four bytes um, is actually the location of our fake heap frame in memory. And I know I just read that off the slide, but I'll expand a little bit more. Um, so what that means is our only pre uh, prerequisite is we need to have a piece of memory somewhere that we can stick our own stuff in that we can reference later. So if it's a local bug, people would use the environment variable, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the environment. Uh, other people might use an argument. Um, other people might actually take advantage of something in the application itself and utilize that. Um, typically, it's best to use something on the stack, but you could use something on the heap hoping that the same location is going to be returned to you every time. Um, so for the things that I've done, it's typically, uh, oh, so as far as remote goes, uh, that's a whole other story. Typically, you have to utilize something that the application is doing because there's however else are you going to get there, right? Uh, so with the first four bytes, we're going to tell it, hey, by the way, the next location is over here. Um, well, let me back up. So what we're doing is we're corrupting a double linked list. It's, that's it. That's, that's it. All of it. So the header is a linked list that says, okay, the next guy is over here and my friend on the left is this way. Uh, and that's it. So if we can say, no, 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 the next guy is this guy and it's something malicious that I control, then we can take advantage of the uh, allocation algorithms uh, that AIX has provided to uh, take advantage and do the things that we want to do. Uh, the last four bytes is actually our heap size. So it tells it how big the chunk of memory is there. So the AIX algorithm can actually take, uh, so can monitor that and take advantage of it uh, when allocating uh, heap chunks that are uh, the same size, it likes to keep it in the same area. And it, I mean, that's something that uh, a lot of people do. Um, and I'm sure we can go into further detail. So we have a buffer of 1024 bytes. Uh, this buffer is the buffer we can corrupt. And you'll see that just after this buffer is our heap header for the next heap segment. Um, so, or the next node in the linked list. Um, so what that allows us to do is, like I mentioned, we're corrupting just eight bytes, and those eight bytes is all we need, are all we need to move things in the other direction. Um, the heap size, so when we're actually corrupting this, heap size doesn't matter. Um, so size doesn't matter. Um, that's what she said. Um, but what, the only requirement is the heap size needs to match the same heap size uh, in our fake frame. So it's pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, so when we, keep, when we create our fake heap frame in memory, um, this heap frame, once again, as I mentioned, is responsible for allowing the heap to uh, have a better understanding of what it's doing and control the, the algorithm in general. Um, the, once again, the element is of links list. Look, I covered a lot of this already. Um, does control, uh, require a controllable location of memory. And our fake frame only requires 16 bytes uh, for this method. So in the next one, it's